beaucoup, bonjour and hello. Um, thank you very much for inviting me and I'm really excited to be here uh, with you and I'm looking forward to an exchange. So in case y you want a short resume on Fran in French or uh, you want to ask a question in French, that won't be a problem, but I prefer to give the full presentation in English um, as it will be clearer anyways. Um, I'm an architect. I have worked several years in urban planning and um, also as an architect. And then I have done a PhD thesis at the Laboratory of Cognitive Neuroscience at the EPFL with Olaf Blanke. And I want to show you a few experiments today that we have conceived, that we have conceived at the lab um, that should be used by designers in the future. And I want to show you here um, an example um, from my practice in the past, let's say from my obscure past before I was a scientist. And um, it is a temporary building in Luanda, in Africa, so far away from our culture. And it was thought for a time also far away from us. And um, we had very simple tools to, to give an answer. And the client, for security reasons, he didn't want to have neither doors nor uh, windows in the building. So this, for an urban situation, this is really a situation of exclusion. It's a very exclusive design where you, you will show also people a status that here is the money and there is, uh, is danger or, or an unsafe uh, situation. So what we did was that this temporary building was built behind the screen, a mirror glass screen, which could be used also for climate protection. And at least um, the screen could reflect a mirror, an urban image, so give a sense of identity to the place. And that is basically where our efforts and also the budget uh, went in. And behind it, the construction was very simple. That is sometimes um, the least you can do as an architect. There are no other instruments that you have in your, uh, as an argument to use, neither with clients nor um, with regulations or with governance. So the question that as an architect, um, you have to ask yourself in that situation is why do we need architecture? And also when we're facing maybe more specific needs or um, health concerns, do we really need architecture? But that, by that I don't mean a roof um, or a ceiling or rooms. Of course we do need that, but architecture is something very specific. And uh, with that first, um, example. I would say yes, because architecture reflects identity. So you can give people a home. You can give people over a lifespan and over um, different um, needs. You can give people accessibility. You can give ownership, representation, and you can create public space, a space for everyone, which should be inclusive. Uh, the cultural codes can be reflected uh, in this kind of architecture and a certain legitimacy or familiarity. Secondly, and I would also say in a younger architecture, which might be the, the architecture of the Middle Ages, it stimulates attention so that our sensory modalities will respond to the environment. For instance, through light and through the surfaces, through the way in which the environment is articulated, um, uh, through the navigation, through functionality. Can I read the environment? Can I see the elements, for instance, a stair that indicates that there is an upper floor? So I would also include aspects of safety, that I really feel safe here, I can read it in my environment, and aspects of health. So that it's an architecture that takes into account that I am a being with, with a whole body. And it's not just representing, it's not just a symbol or a sign. And um, thirdly, what I would argue today 
um, is that architecture enables perspective. So that beyond just giving me um, a hint whether I'm inside or outside a building, let's say, I am really part of the space and I am enabled to design the space. Um, and this is why I would um, really propose participation and co-design. I think that this is disturbing you a little bit. I wonder if, if is it okay. So um, an architecture that enables perspective, and this is something that uh, comes from the experiments that I will show you in a second, so that, <clears throat> so that we have found that in architecture you have an overlap of social perspective and of a visual spatial perspective, so that you have both. You have what we usually consider in architecture, what we usually design in architecture as a visual spatial perspective, and secondly, you also find uh, an overlap with social perspective. You, you, you will find both, and this I find particularly intriguing, and I think that it's particularly interesting for the future to develop a more inclusive design for public space. And let's say in general, I would say that yes, we need architecture because it reflects identity and it stimulates interaction and it enables participation. And this is nothing new. Um, if you know the psychologist Rudolf Arnheim, um, he described in, uh, in a book, The Dynamics of Architectural Form, uh, which is uh, Gestalt Psychology for, for Architects. Um, he described a, a short episode when he visited the Statue of Liberty and the difference between the appearance outside and inside, that he completely lost a we are inside uh, the Statue of Liberty. So when you are in the interior, you completely lose the notion of where you are. And from the outside, of course, you clearly see that it's a statue. But that is a bit the difference of this idea of the inside and outside of uh, this architecture that stimulates attention. This is a clear example for that. And secondly, also, in, um, throughout the last 500 years in architecture, we have this primordial myth where architects used to discuss human needs based on a, f um, let's say, a fantasy of who the primordial uh, people were and what they needed. And so to, to discuss the question what architecture really needs, what are the basic architectural needs we have. So this would be a second argument for um, attention, for an architecture that modulates attention. And um, thirdly, starting in the Middle Age, architects started to manipulate form. And we needed an invention to do so. And um, this invention was possible through these two experiments um, performed, uh, the first experiment and the second experiment performed by the architect Brunel Leski to show that actually only one person can occupy one point of view. And you can construct this point of view mathematically. So we have a way to simulate what a person sees, but just visually, so not completely. And he showed that in the first experiment with a mirror, and in the second experiment uh, with a painting that was covering the actual building. So when you moved, um, the perspective was not correct anymore. And you see that this is how perspective is being constructed. Uh, this is us as architects, so it's a little bit the God perspective, if you want. And this is the inhabitant and the shape that is being created with perspective for the inhabitant. And you see that if we come back to um, neuroscience, we have, like here, 
uh, the allocentric view. The viewer is outside. And here we have an egocentric view. So this is really the subject, EO. And the question is, how can we make this work so that we can be users and designers at the same time? Because even if I'm an architect, sometimes I'm just a user. So I experience myself being both. And I think that there is a whole spectrum of, of users um, that could benefit from being integrated in the design process. And one uh, very good example for um, this integration or this consideration of social space um, is the St. Peter Square, where the natural topography was um, petrified with stone and um, the people inside could see during a mass, they could see when the square is full, they could see everyone else. So you really get uh, an, a view of everyone who is present in the square. So a social space is being constructed. And um, this, of course, was to reflect uh, the the size of the church and the power of this institution. But in fact, you can really use this instrument perspective to construct also more inclusive spaces and um, to, to consider more needs. Uh, there are several notions linked to this, uh, to the sensation in the interior. And you see here, on top, the question whether we project our sensation on an object, do we do that when we see a building or when we see a, um, furniture or something, do we project emotion on it? Secondly, do we feel it in our whole body? Um, and thirdly, is it rather like we are immersed in a space? And in the 19th century, this was discussed in concurrence, people had the feeling one thing is wrong and one argument is correct. But in fact, uh, when doing the experiments at the lab, we found out that everything is true. It depends in which situation. So you could modulate sensation in, the, in different manners. And if we don't take action on that, it could happen in an uncontrolled way. Uh, in order to measure um, this sensation of the interior at the lab, we created um, an avatar, <coughs> and uh, which is an image of ourselves. I will show you in, uh, in a minute how that works. And um, we created two interiors, a larger and a more narrow one. And um, the scientific method that we have used is a visual tactile integration. And I think that this could be interesting uh, for the discussion here because it's a sensory uh, replacement so that when you have um, perception, usually you integrate different views and tactile perception as one um, as one combined into one vision. So you see here in the middle um, the rubber hand illusion. Uh, here you see the real hand of the participant, which is hidden behind the cloth. And in front of the participant, visible is a rubber hand. And you see that visually the person is being stroked on the rubber hand and uh, behind the cloth so that I don't see it, I'm being stroked on my physical hand. And in, if this happens uh, at the same time, in synchrony, I will associate vision and the feeling. But with the feeling, of, I will project the feeling to the rubber hand. So I will integrate um, my feeling for the rubber hand for my own hand to the rubber hand. And um, the same experiment was produced uh, without a rubber hand, 
just with a tabletop. So we wondered whether it is possible that you have the same feelings for the space, ownership feeling for a wall or a chair or a tabletop and your own body, whether there is a parallel. And um, perspective comes in when you take the full body, when you shift from the hand, rubber hand, to the full body perspective, because you could experience shifts in perspective to the back or to the front. This was the experiment done uh, by Olaf Blanke at the Laboratory of Cognitive Neuroscience uh, with a participant filmed from behind and wearing goggles. So you see yourself from your back on the goggles. You get an image of yourself in front of yourself on the goggles and you're seeing yourself being stroked on the back and this can be at the same time with the avatar or displaced in time and now you start um, entering the body of your avatar when it is um, stroked uh, in synchrony so you start feeling that the body of the avatar, the image that you see, is like your own body. And you start to feeling displaced towards that body. And the same thing happens also with a fake body, uh, but not with a virtual object. So the finding that I have shown you before with the tabletop actually could not be reproduced uh, in this experiment at the lab. Uh, what we hypothesized was that when you take room size as a parameter, uh, when you are in this grasping space that we have already discussed in previous presentations, uh, you will have a different re response, a uh, multisensory response, and when you have the walls or the construction in the distant space, the response will be more visual. So that was what we thought uh, would happen when we performed the experiment. So you see here the participant uh, in the large space. We place the walls um, in the distant space. And you see here uh, what the participant sees on the glasses. And this was basically the work in this uh, experiment to generate that view so that the full body could be seen at the right distance uh, from the camera or from the viewer and that the walls, the perspective could be seen in a, in a relatively, uh, in, at the distance from the body and be perceived as a space. And secondly, you see this is the walls, they could be moved. And here you see the narrow space, so the camera from behind, the participant being filmed, and having this view on the glasses. So this is me, and this is what I see on the glasses. And this is my colleague who was stroking me on the back. And you see that I can see this at the same time. Or sometimes it's displaced. And when this is happening at the same time, I suddenly feel that I'm there. And what happened, what we found was actually that people really project themselves into this narrow space uh, when they are stroked on the back. So when they f identify with the avatar, they really feel like they were inside that space. And if we don't, um, it remains a flat image to them. They can't really enter um, the virtual space. And we measured this with an estimation task. So how correctly would they judge um, the length of a line on the floor that at the beginning they saw uh, vertically? So when they were stroked and when they identified with the avatar, uh, the estimations were more correct and the size of the uh, space was judged more correctly or deeper, let's say. Because in the end it's an image, so it was anyhow, it's an illusion. 
And uh, we made a series of these experiments, you see also with avatar and without avatar. And if you take away the avatar, um, the effects disappear. Um, it's in this slide. When you take away the avatar, uh, people didn't really feel, so we reproduced that same finding that I can't really identify with walls or with the front wall. But what people say is that they could see the space in front, they could see the stroking happen inside a space. And when the stroking is not, um, uh, is not uh, synchronous, basically this sensation is not there. Then the question, uh, on the one hand, we could show that um, this kind of experiment work if we find uh, the, um, uh, the parameters, if we can define certain variables and we can find certain dependencies between the parameters, we can uh, measure and develop methods at the laboratory for, um, for a designer to understand, to better understand the spaces that we are creating and also to uh, include other um, participants and other groups of participants. I think that there is a big potential for that. But on the other hand, um, there is also a history of buildings, of physical buildings, and I would like to show you one in particular. And, an example that is from the Bauhaus by an architect who claimed that building is uh, applied psychology and he refused to work with floor plans. Uh, he wanted to build immediately in the space and he would determine his architecture based on haptics. So an idea to apply this research with virtual reality could be that. Uh, to study space less in the second dimension, but more using novel technologies and using virtual reality to present it, or also other illusions, sensory illusions, to really try to understand how this per, uh, space works uh, for everyone, so what the different responses can be. And you see here, this is the uh, school by Hannes Meyer and Hans Witwer, the Bundesschule uh, close to Berlin. It was called the Kleine Bauhaus. And what you see here uh, are the dormitories, four buildings which are connected through a corridor which is more than 100 meter long. So you have a lot of time when you are in this corridor. You have a lot of time to meet. Um, when there's few people in the building, it can be a very weird sensation, but I imagine that back at the time, it was quite lively. What I find um, particular is that there is a slope, and it follows um, the natural slope. So when you are in the interior, it's almost like you were walking on the grass, and there is a very strong connection in the interior of this building uh, to the outside. So this is a second view of the stairs where here you walk up to the seminar rooms and you see that the seminar rooms, they have a very particular geometry. They are relatively small and the windows are designed in a way so that when you enter, you see the outdoors, but when you sit down, you just see the sky so that you can focus on the task of the day. Uh, perspective is a very uh, powerful means in this design. And um, as I said before, the introduction of green elements from the exterior in the building is really present on the one hand through the glass uh, facade outside. And on the other hand, uh, in the dormitory where the color also of the interior is being um, uh, used to pick up the, the element of greenery. And uh, with a few 
experiment uh, with a few students we did like an experimental um, art project in this building we scanned this interior space the seminar room with a lot of different atmospheres and we created a game uh, where you would stand inside the seminar space when you put on the goggles and you have um, a few floating balls so it's like a game that recreates the building as a museum and if you click on these balls you get a video which shows you the experience of one of the students in the building so the daily the daily tasks or the daily experiences and you could also change uh, the daylight and when the experience was over you could manipulate objects in the space um, that the students put there related to their experience so you could use these tools it's interactive uh, virtual reality so you could use that tool really to manipulate the space and to adapt atmospheres and here I have a short no I'm sorry it won't work no so sur quick time C'était une immersion en vidéo, c'est ça Oui. Pour tester le... Oui, cette... en voyant aussi les gens, l'interaction des gens. Avec le, le, la réalité virtuelle de l'espace que oui. vous venez de montrer. Oui, exactement. Euh, et pour montrer aussi que les gens interagissent euh, vraiment avec l'espace. Hein, hein. um, so that the illusion of space is really there, you can really interact with the objects and there was also a sound attached to the object and so you can really understand how a person explores the space. Est-ce que Isabella, ça se terminait sur cette vidéo oui. en attendant alors je propose que pendant que Enzo trouve une solution miraculeuse, nous nous retournions vers... Merci pour cette présentation euh, qui était très riche. Est-ce que du coup, il y a des questions qui peuvent se poser en français euh, Isabella est très à l'aise en français, même si elle préférait faire sa présentation en anglais. Par rapport à tout ce que vous avez vu et les... Et vous l'avez compris, les potentialités en fait, de la réalité virtuelle et de ces expériences qui permettent de se projeter dans les espaces pour euh, finalement euh, aussi interagir, tester, configurer, créer. Ça peut être une question là, vers les architectes aussi de la salle euh, pour euh, imaginer euh, et designer, j'ai envie de dire, euh, des futurs espaces euh, potentiellement. Est-ce qu'il y a des, je sais pas, des questions par rapport à tout ça Je posais une question très longue, hein, mais... Pas spécialement. Alors, euh, moi, je, je vais poser des questions. Alors, Isabella, est-ce que du coup, euh, euh, vous voyez des applications possibles euh, par rapport euh, typiquement à ce qu'on a entendu aujourd'hui, euh, si on veut inclure euh, des usagers euh, euh, Ah, ça, ça veut dire que la vidéo marche. Merci, Moenzo. Tant pis. C'est une immersion. Euh, voilà. Vous, vous, voilà, vous allez vous concentrer. Ah, ma, non, plein écran, c'est décevant. Maintenant, tu es allé trop loin, Enzo. Hein. Tu, tu nous montres cette vidéo. C'est censé faire quelque chose, Isabella, euh, le décor s'anime.
On continue les conversations avec Isabella en attendant. <rire> du coup, en, par rapport à ce que tu as entendu aujourd'hui, Isabella, euh, et, de, de, et du ressenti des usagers, de la façon peut-être de faire autrement l'architecture, est-ce que toi, tu vois des possibilités avec cet outil et ces expériences, euh, peut-être de designer autrement Oui, bien sûr, parce qu'on peut récréer des situations à l'intérieur d'une architecture future. Alors, on pourra recréer, par exemple, une, une situation, disons, de stress ou hectique de, dedans une, une architecture et voir euh, quelles sont les mesures ou s'il faut des petites adaptations, euh, s'il faut des petits changements, si, par exemple, les questions d'avant avec euh, les verres ou avec la, la personnalisation d'un espace, est-ce que ça peut marcher pour, euh, pour les, les usagers futurs c'est justement une manière de se projeter. De préfigurer finalement l'espace oui. et de l'améliorer avec et d'inclure l'usager potentiellement aussi pour lui faire ressentir oui. et ajuster, aider à l'ajustement potentiel. Oui. Et deuxièmement, euh, je pense qu'il y a du grand potentiel aussi, ce qu'on a vu aujourd'hui, pour intégrer des technologies. Euh, alors qu'en en, en utilisant la technologie pour planifier un bâtiment futur, on pourra... Euh, y intégrer une, une augmentation de l'espace, si ça peut être intéressant ou si ça peut t'aider. Oui, ça veut dire que finalement, il y aura l'espace réel et il y aura l'espace virtuel mm -hmm. qui peut venir un espace de réconfort qu'on peut ajuster et, et faire du sur-mesure pour l'usager qui pourrait moduler son espace de confort. Oui. Est-ce qu'il y a des remarques par rapport à ces propositions Je ne sais pas si je me retourne à nouveau vers la... soit en ligne, soit l'assistance. qui viennent de la véritable réalité de la personne et l'aider peut-être à reconstruire différemment son environnement. Par exemple, on peut imaginer qu'un qu patient soit placé dans sa chambre ou une personne dans, même au-delà de l'hôpital, hein, une personne dans sa chambre ou dans, un enfant dans une salle de classe. Est-ce qu'on aurait la possibilité peut-être de photographier cet environnement, de l'implémenter dans ce type de logiciel, pour permettre à la personne, finalement, d'ajuster son environnement à partir de l'existant Est-ce que ça, c'est des pistes qui sont possibles Oui, bien sûr. Ici, euh, ce que j'avais... Non. Voilà. Ce que j'avais montré ici, c'est euh, une, euh, une caméra à 360 degrés donc, on l'a utilisé avec les étudiants pour faire des petits films panoramiques. C'est les films qui sont intégrés dans les boules, en fait. Euh, on a accès, on pourrait s'imaginer qu'on a comme un, un repère où on a accès à différentes euh, réalités parallèles. Et puis, au même temps, on a créé avec euh, ces images, on a créé tous les... J'ai pris une photo chaque heure. Euh, on a créé... Euh, tout, tous les horaires, toutes les, les situations de lumière. Donc, on voit aussi le soleil qui, qui voyage d'un côté à l'autre et, et toute l'ombre et, et tout ça à l'intérieur. Et on l'a numérisé. Donc, sans devoir modéliser, euh, il y a des algorithmes qui peuvent traduire ça dans une 3D et on peut manipuler tous les éléments qui sont dans le bâtiment. Il y a une petite application qui fait ça. Donc, c'est très facile d'avoir un à côté l'un de l'autre la réalité euh, filmée et puis la réalité euh, digitalisée qu'on peut manipuler parce que, évidemment, le filmé n'est pas manipulable après. Par contre, dans le filmé, je sais que ça, ça a été fait au laboratoire, euh, euh, notamment avec lequel j'avais fait les expériences, qu'on utilise ces caméras justement pour faire euh, euh, des expériences avec... Euh, des gens neuroatypiques en, en, en communication avec des autres pour comprendre un peu la perspective, le changement de perspective. Donc on peut filmer, euh, des, le, le film a, a l'avantage qu'on peut filmer des gens, par exemple, qui entrent tous en même temps dans une salle. Et on peut faire ça aussi dans, avec le virtuel, mais c'est beaucoup plus fictif, ça a beaucoup plus l'air d'être un, un jeu après, c'est différent, mais je, je pense que ça pourrait marcher euh, aussi. Oui, c'est-à-dire faire un rendu, euh, vaut mieux faire le film pour un rendu très, très vrai et qui projette, plutôt oui. que de, un rendu euh, 3D, même très bien fait, qui serait plus euh, factice. Oui, 
Ça, c'est plus utile pour euh, la manipulation des objets. Ça, ça se sert vraiment si on veut euh, manipuler des sons. Que moi, quand je m'assois sur la selle, euh, chaise, euh, elle fait un son, par exemple, des, des choses comme ça, la manipulation euh, de l'environnement. Et je pense que la forme de jeu, elle peut ici, on voulait l'utiliser pour construire un petit musée virtuel. Donc c'est pour ça qu'on avait fait quelque chose comme un repère, un petit archive de différentes images avec des nœuds on peut, où on peut accéder. Mais je pense que ça peut être utilisé bien sûr pour des autres situations. Angela Sirigou, vous vouliez... Oui, dernière question, parce qu'effectivement après on va, on va enchaîner, il y a... Le professeur Magda Mustafa qui nous attend. Ça va, ça va être très rapide. Uh, thank you, Isabella. Um, I'm going to speak in English. Uh, so you show uh, to different by talking about different research in the neuroscience literature also that uh, virtual reality can fool our sensation, our mm -hmm. body sensation, right? So I was wondering uh, how good is virtual reality to uh, to study how we apprise space, how we process space, you know, and how we, we like to be in a specific uh, space layout, you know. Mm -hmm. um, there are studies that show um, that virtual reality is a one-to-one, -one, um, you know, is a one-to-one -one representation, but, uh, and these studies are mostly made by architects, but when you're looking at the studies I have shown, Je ne sais pas si on va aller voir, en fait, s'il n'y a pas Enzo avec toi, Isabelle. Oh, okay. Il y a une petite dissociation d'écran. Ah, oui. Oui. Um, this task... Uh, would in the, for this task, actually, we assume that the space is flattened in virtual reality. We know that it's, it's perceived as flatter. So you need to do uh, this a, a kind of stimulation or to give people a task so that they move in the space. If you just show it visually, uh, like it's done in passive virtual reality, the space is much flatter. So one, one way to do it would be to use, uh, a, to, to augment the space by using this tactile stimulation, this full body illusion that you put people into the space. And the other way would be to give them a task, to give them object they can interact with. And then the space becomes um, deeper. But if you have just people sitting there, it's, it's an image even if it's really 3D and mapped out. But if they can walk around and they can, you know, have different points of view and changes of perspective, then the space gets much more three-dimensional. But it's true that it's, uh, it could be, the delicate part could be that it's just a sensory replacement through vision, that you replace the senses through vision. Because what we have found here is that when people see these walls being closed, so they feel touched. So there is an, an, an interaction between um, the different parameters, between the different variables. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Isabella Pasqualini.